thy father and thy mother. Thou shalt not kill. Thou shalt not commit adultery. I am the Lord thy God. Thou shalt not have strange gods before me. Thou shalt not take the name of the Lord thy God in vain. I try not to lie, but I probably have. Yep. Um, have I stolen anything? No. I haven't stolen lately. Did a little shoplifting in college, but you know. Who said you should only deal with that which is comfortable or serves you? It doesn't say that in the commandments. If it's comfortable, and if it adds to your self-esteem, thou shalt. Otherwise, forget it. I am the Lord thy God. No, I didn't read that anywhere. Do not take the name of the Lord your God in vain. We probably broke that one. <laughs> but basically, we don't really break them. We're, we're Catholic school trained. <laughs> God's Word is for all time, and we're going to need it forever and ever, and even more today. Without inner discipline, that which we do becomes mundane. The only way to elevate life is to have some sense of values and standards. Now, from the SNET Oakdale Theater in Wallingford, Connecticut, radio's leading talk show host, Dr. Laura Schlesinger. People who knew me say the first three decades of my life, oh really, how many more decades than that is she? Uh, would probably be stunned, shocked, surprised, and amazed that I'm here tonight, not that I'm here tonight per se, but that I'm here tonight talking about God, the Ten Commandments. Because for most of my life, I was not the slightest bit religious. I thought God stuff was Rod Serling material on the Twilight Zone. Interesting, cute, but don't bother me with that. I have important things to be and do. Just to give you some background, how I got from that place to this place, because I still think it's astonishing and I'm moved, and there are probably a significant number of people in this audience who are ambivalent who are, I won't say atheists. I used to say I was an atheist, but I didn't have enough knowledge to be even that convicted. I just didn't think about it at all. So I won't even use that word. I was just zero in an empty box in the whole thing. My father was a nice Jewish boy from Brooklyn who was a second lieutenant in World War II, liberating Italy. And when he got to the top of Italy, to a town called Gorizia on the border of what used to nicely be Yugoslavia, which is kind of a, sadly a mess now, he met my mother, a nice Italian Catholic girl. And they <gasps> <gasps> fell in love like something in the movies. Neither of them, for reasons never discussed, embraced their religion. So I wasn't brought up with any religion per se, any discussions about God, any discussions about Catholicism, Judaism, anythingism. Nothing. And however, they were very ethical people. There's something different when we take it in as commanded or when we take it in as sounds like a good idea intellectually. And I'm going to get to that differential. So I was brought up with no religion and Many of my friends had religions, so I'd go to their house and hear their religions. So, you know, every friend I went to, I converted for that week. And, uh, you know, it all sounded good for me. And then, of course, the movie started. Ben-Hur, Ten Commandments, greatest story ever told. I mean, I, you know, you watch these movies, you're not even sure which side everybody's on, but it's all very stirring. And still, it made no difference to me. I started a change, and I got a glimmer of something. It's like a little switch was attempting to turn itself on, because I think there is an imperative in all of us to have an ascendancy 
in our lives of some kind to give us purpose and meaning ultimately. And I had always been very successful at everything I did. And that's fun and that's exciting and you feel proud of your hard work and you feel proud of where it took you. But for me, I was constantly walking around with that song in my head, is this all there is? Do I have to climb another mountain? Why can't I enjoy this mountain? Why do I always have to look for another mountain? What is that? And ultimately feeling, what is the purpose? What is the meaning of my life? Well, at about 35, I suddenly, from watching PBS, this is no joke, I'm not saying it because I'm here, watching PBS, the Nova series. Do you remember that? This was great. An hour. All you women are going to go, <laughs> yeah, right. There was an egg, and they went in with the fiber optics, and you saw the egg coming down the fallopian tube. And then they showed one egg. Then they showed the millions of sperm. Millions. And then they showed that moment where that one sperm connected with that one egg. And 40 minutes later, there's a baby. <sighs> I figured, okay, <laughs> sounds good to me. And Lou and I got married. 40 minutes later, you have a baby. And when Derek was born, I was struck with two things in particular. One, a profound sense of obligation. Now, we since the 60s, how many of you in here remember the 60s? Do the rest of you know who the Beatles are? <laughs> we remember obligation was, t t that's a bad thing. That's constraining. That's limiting. That's bad. That destroys your individuality. That makes you <gasps> unhappy, which of course is the epitome of all things, that at every moment you should be happy. But I felt this profound sense of obligation which, for which you have some ambivalence. All of you who have had children know that they are relentless and they're tyrants. I just fed you. I just changed you. I just hugged you. I just loved you up. What's the matter now? So it's relentless, but you have this elevated sense of purposefulness because you're living for something outside of yourself. And that was the beginning of my religious journey. It introduced me to the concept of obligation outside of myself and potentially to God, but I just didn't buy that. I mean, except for here, didn't see any perpetually burning bushes. I'm one of these people, it has to be concrete. Derek and I were watching <laughs> another PBS special, and he was about five, and it was on the Holocaust. And Elizabeth Taylor's voice was the voiceover while they were showing the actual Nazi footage of when the SS were shooting the naked women with their children into troughs, and my finger froze on the channel changer. I wanted to change it so badly, I can't tell you, because I've got my little son here who starts asking questions to which there are no rational answers. Well, a few of them. Who are those? Those are Nazi soldiers in World War II in Germany. Who are they shooting? those women with the babies, well, who are they? Jews. Well, why are they shooting them? They're mean. What are you going to tell a little kid? But why are they shooting women and babies? I really don't know. I mean, I was so stunned and horrified, and here I am trying to give answers to this kid, and he says to me, who are Jews? And I said, those are our people. Mind you, in my whole life, there had been no connection. At that moment, it was, oh, I went back 4,000 years. Boom, right at that moment. And he said, what's a Jew? 
I said, I have no idea, but I promise you I'll find out. Shooting ahead, we're sitting around watching Discovery Channel. <laughs> And it was a thing on history and historical things from the Bible where they were taking Bible parts and seeing what there actually was in written history to go with it or archaeological history and they're doing all of this. And they're doing when the Romans took down the temple in Jerusalem, the second time the temple went down and it's very interesting and I'm half watching it, half doing something else. And Derek and Lou are watching it very intently but I'm reading, a, I don't know what I'm doing, I'm paying attention to something else. And my husband says, and this was my introduction to God. This was, God, this is Laura. Laura, this is God. Nice to meet you. This was the absolute moment. My husband turns to me, who has since converted, and says, odd, don't you think? And I said, what, dear? And he said, how many cultures, because they're showing this on this program, how many cultures for 4,000 years have tried to eliminate this tiny, tiny little group of people and they're still here. I dropped the book and started, it's a little personal here at this point, and I started to cry because I said, oh my God, I know we'll get to the third commandment, not to break out on me, but I said, oh my God, at the moment, I'm just trying to be honest, I don't want to bear false witness. Uh, <laughs> the covenant must be true. There is a God, because that was the deal, made at Sinai. And I am walking around the house, infused with this realization I don't know what to do with, and this sense of acceptance. It's at once, it was at once for me, very peaceful and very nice, very comforting, and very confusing, what do I do with this? Now, that was the genesis of, <laughs> of reading Torah and studying it. I spoke to a group of 3,500 people in LA at a book festival. And I asked this teeming room, how many of you believe in God? Just about every hand shot up. How many of you follow the Ten Commandments. Just about every hand went up. You saw so much pride in this room, it was amazing. And I said, who can name them? <laughs> One hand shot up. An itty bitty boy about so high who had just gotten them in catechism class. His priest was so proud. And it's astonishing how we believe in God, but we often don't spend the time believing God. So it's very interesting that more people seem to say they live by the Ten Commandments than know what they're about, or what they really mean, or what the ramifications are in your life. And I'll tell you from a personal framework, sometimes a criticism is thrown at me about being black and white. No gray area. Well, you know what? That's right. <laughs> you know what the gray area is? You wheedling out of what you know you should be doing by saying, but there, my circumstances are different. These circumstances are different. This situation is different. It doesn't really pertain here because we tie ourselves into pretzels when, frankly, it is a big relief. I get into certain situations myself and I go, I can't do that. And I don't have to wheedle, negotiate, suffer. But what makes the Ten Commandments so remarkable? I mean, think about it. When you look at the Ten Commandments, they're intellectually things you could have designed. Well, let's see, if you really want to get people to get along, <laughs> they better not be taking each other's things. That makes for discourse. Don't mess with their spouses. That gets people really testy. 
you know, if you lie about them and they find out dead meat. I mean, there are some things in there. Basically, other cultures had come up with most of these things. And probably, if we got together as a group and we hadn't thought them through, we'd come up with these. So what is the big deal? Well, there's a big deal on a number of levels. One, this is the only time in history, and this is what sort of shakes me, because this, this was my defining moment, where God spoke to a people Something on the order of 600,000 people heard and felt and saw a direct revelation. That is amazing. It's not like Moses came out of his tent and said, I had a discussion with God, this is what you have to do. And people would say, yeah, right, go back and have another discussion. So this was not somebody reporting on God. This was God revealing self. Each person heard God's words independently, yet everybody heard them in unison. You heard them by your ability to understand, you heard them by your ability to understand, you heard them by your ability to understand, but we all heard. So what was exceptional about that moment is that it was personal and communal. Now there's also something else very important about here. This God, had taken a people out of slavery and bondage and set them free, these people had experienced salvation from slavery from God and were now asked, what, to give up their virgin daughters for sacrifice into a volcano? No, they were asked to be ethical. We're in the history of God's. Was God a moral, supreme will? Moral will. Think about what all the gods were. We had gods of fertility, you rubbed their tummy. We had gods of this, gods of that, gods of that. They fought with each other. My God's better than your God. We'd go to war and then we get rid of your gods and we have our gods. This is the first time in the history of mankind there was the representation of universal and eternal morality. That's what makes that moment so incredible. And it was, I have demonstrated my love with your salvation from slavery. This is what I'm asking of you. Does this sound paralleled? for how all our relationships should be, tied by obligation. That's what's remarkable about this. It's an obligatory relationship. And again, we come back to that, and I think that's why a lot of people, frankly, are hostile about religion. We want mostly religion to make us feel good. I wanna be able to call on God as a valet or a tooth fairy when I need help and support. I have a stomach ache, God, where are the Tums? But this is a reciprocal, obligatory relationship. God needs us to complete his creation, and we need God to put meaning into our existence. It's a mutual, obligatory relationship. To make it more simple, God makes wheat, we take the wheat and make it into bread. So without inner discipline, that which we do becomes mundane. The only way to elevate life is to have some sense of values and standards because we make it special. I'm thinking about a call I had a week ago of a young woman in her early 20s, about 24. We were negotiating how many men you had to be with before you could be a slut. She said 20, I said, I think that does it. <laughs> and then the call took one of those turns that there, there are times, very rare, but there are times 
I wish I could share physically with the audience, but it's radio, because it's such an emotional moment that I think even the visual contact adds to it, where I said, you know, I feel bad for you. Well, why? I'm having fun. And I said, really? It's like wearing a wedding gown to take out the garbage. It's a schmata then, you know? It doesn't mean anything. The stuff that you keep in your closet and save for that special thing, it means something symbolically. And I said, sex for you means nothing. And how many ways are there in the universe to make meaning out of life? Sex within the covenantal relationship becomes sacred, holy, and no less sexy. In fact, even more so because you're free to express yourself with acceptance and reciprocity. There's something very special and safe and wonderful. And I said, and you don't have that. You've lost making this meaningful. And she was, it was one of those moments, they don't happen very often, where it was a complete shift. And she said, you're right. And here was the part that was really important. She said, but how do I resist him? How do I resist the impulse? Because we have become a society that makes impulses commandments. And that's where the acceptance of a framework which is divine, universal, and eternal, we're just potentially moral. You had 16 opportunities today to demonstrate if you were moral. And we all failed some of them. Mostly because we didn't stop and think. Mostly because we have bad habits. And mostly because we know how to justify and rationalize just about everything we do. And every husband and wife in this room will testify to that. You've done stupid stuff you know is wrong, and you'll stand there and argue all day about how it wasn't. But frankly, think about what this life would be like walking down the street at night. Think about what this life would be like if you knew that every person accepted the commandments and lived by them. You would know that they were probably more consistent and persistent and ultimately predictable in their goodness. I'm often asked, well, if a person is not religious, can't they be good? I suppose so, yeah, yeah. But I really believe, and I've taken a while to get to this place, I really, truly, thoroughly believe that we are more consistent and persistent in goodness when we feel obligated, out of gratitude, out of love, out of awe, out of fear, whatever you term it for God, that we have that relationship and we don't want to betray it. And the basic rule is to be ethical. So yes, it gets very black and white and there are things that are just very clear to you then. But you see, all the ancient gods, we put some fruit, vegetables, or our firstborn daughter in front of them and we hope to get what we want. This God is not a tooth fairy. There's a very special relationship here of obligation and appreciation. Which leads me into what in Jewish tradition is the first commandment. I am the Lord your God. And I took you out of bondage, out of slavery. Even in Jewish tradition, there has been tremendous argument, where is the commandment? It's not commanded, therefore, love me. It doesn't say that. It doesn't say, bow or grovel. It doesn't say that. It doesn't say, sacrifice your life. It doesn't say that. It says, because I'm your mother. Remember that one? I'm your mother. I'm a mother, and I've said that. What are we trying to establish when we say that? 
I gave you life. That's why. That gives me justification for saying, eat the cauliflower. <laughs> well, maybe not that one. I have always found that one sadistic. I'm making the parallel so that you can understand again the obligatory relationship is a statement of what I mean. It's a statement that establishes authority. I am that which did this for you. It establishes authority and relationship. It's like a preamble. But I find it a commandment. It's just not as simplistically put as, don't steal. Steal is a no-no. Don't do that. Out. We're more clear on things like that. Okay, tell me exactly what I should do and what I shouldn't do. There was a story, and it's a true story, about uh, uh, the gentleman's name, forgive me, I don't remember, but he had worked his whole life to become president of this Bible college. And he had finally gotten to that place. And he gave it up because his wife contracted Alzheimer's. And friends and family said to him, what is your problem? Take the job. You've worked her whole life for it. She doesn't even know who you are. Now, that's compelling. If she doesn't know who I am, Where's the obligation? But you see, it's that triangle I keep bringing up to your attention, where just because you won't be embarrassed or watch anybody's hurt feelings because their brain is not capable of computing that, doesn't mean that what you're doing suddenly becomes noble, moral, or right. His answer was, she doesn't know who I am, but I know who she is. She's the woman who loved me, who stood by me, who gave birth to and raised my children. I still know who she is. And that's really what the first commandment sets us up to appreciate and understand. And wouldn't you all feel more comfortable and more safe if you knew your partner absolutely cherished obligation. We're going to take a break. There is more to discover about the Ten Commandments when we continue this program. But right now, this station needs your financial support. So take a moment, call the number on your screen, Thank you. We have a brief amount of time to go into incredible depth on nine commandments. <laughs> so I'm just going to give you what struck me in particular. The second commandment has to do with not making idols, not having any other gods dash idols. There's hardly anybody in the room who thinks that pertains to you. I mean, how many idols have you carved at home? Yet idol worship takes on so many interesting indirect forms, like peer pressure, where you sacrifice what you know to be good, right, and decent for acceptance by a group. And so you bow to their will. See, there are a myriad of ways we do things which go against the commandments we say we all live by. Yet the most religious people seem to very simply not bow to that God either and to do what's right. An obvious demonstration of that it's what the Jewish people call the righteous Gentiles. The Christians who put themselves and their families and their children at great risk 
to sequester and protect Jews whom they didn't even know. Very rarely was their personal knowledge. And when they asked these people all oh, these years later, why did you risk this? Do you know they could have shot your babies? I said, yeah, of course I didn't want that to happen. I love my children, I love my family, and I don't want to be dead. But I had to do what was right. It was so extraordinary reading the biographies of those people because I expected some big thing about why in particular. And it was simple. It was black and white. That was black. And I'm adding light. Now the third commandment, this is the first time God seems to show some temper. You carry my name in vain <laughs> and you're in deep trouble. And when you first read that you go, what is the big deal? And then you test it out. Oh God. Didn't happen. What's the big deal? It is a very important big deal, because remember what I talked about earlier on, how our relationship with God, consequently our relationship with each other, is based upon obligation and gratitude? Well, let's just say you work for my ice cream company, okay? And you're going around the town selling ice cream to little kids. And you're dressed like a bum. You have, you know, cigarettes hanging out of your mouth. Foul words are all the time. And you're nasty to the kids. Forget the parents. You don't give the right change. And more often than not, you drop the ice cream on the floor because you get a charge out of doing that and watching the kids cry. Okay? And my name is on your truck. Who looks bad? Me. You cast aspersions on my identity, and you make this lady and this gentleman lose faith and a sense of connectedness to me. So when we look throughout history and we see the Crusades, when we see the KKK, when we see people carrying symbolically or verbally saying that this is God's will and doing evil with it, you can understand why God might make that a big no-no. Because that's the only real threat in the Ten Commandments. Alienating people from God and alienating yourself from God for being very casual with God's name. And we all do that. And since I was brought up not religious, for me to say, oh, God, oh, God, God, oh, God, all the time, oh, please, all the time, was part and parcel, that casualness was part and parcel of my alienation. So when we are frivolous with God's name, I don't think God's having fits over this, but that's just me. But I think what we've done is pull ourselves away. Because the more casual with which we treat each other, it tends to show a lack of respect. When we show a lack of respect and regard, how does that measure our behaviors toward that person? In this society, we don't teach children to say Mr. and Mrs. Smith, sir and ma'am. That's too oppressive. Yet when children were brought up with those expectations, it contributed to their sense of their identity, the respected identity, and it added something important to the relationship as opposed to eight-year-olds thinking you're their equal. The fourth commandment is my favorite, and it's probably the one I've struggled with the most, the Sabbath. Now, a lot of people think, cool, a day of rest. It's not what it's about. This is something extraordinary and new. The first thing in the Bible at the end of the sequence of creation is that God defines the seventh day as holy time. No other religion had come up with the concept of time 
as holy. And why should time be holy? What an odd thing. And that's the point. We're used to things. We were given dominion over the land, dominion over animals. And do you know what we have no control over at all? Time. We spend six days being powerful, manipulative, arrogant, controlling, creative. We tend to think we're godlike. Now, Saturday, Shabbos, Shabbat for Jews, was quite a shock to me because after a week of working, Saturday, you go shopping. <laughs> Isn't that a holy experience? I find it a spiritual moment when I can find something that fits. So in my conversion, the first couple of Saturdays, truth, I stayed in bed. I was so depressed, and I felt it was the only way I could discipline myself not to do anything else. I just stayed in bed. So I went back to class the next week, and I said, I'm having trouble with the Shabbat thing. So then I started, when I was able to get out of bed, started going to synagogue. And here I am in three hours of prayer, and it's almost like an altered state. And we'd come out of there, and I remember one of the first times my son, and I thought, oh, this is not going to fly. <laughs> I'm going to take a kid his age and say, guess what? Remember all that stuff we used to do? Gone. Why? Wonderful mother. You know? He came out of synagogue, and he said, thank you for taking us here today. He said, it was, it was sort of nice where you take that time, and you're with family, and you're in prayer, and you're in study, and you're reconnecting to what is universal, to what is eternal, and to what ultimately gives your life meaning. And it's not easy. In modern day culture, it is extremely tough. The fifth commandment usually ticks everybody off. Honor thy father and thy mother. Those creeps, they're a pain in the more often than not. You know, sometimes you're in a tug of war with somebody and you're pulling on the rope and they're pulling on the rope back and you're pulling on the rope and they're pulling on the rope and then you go to see a therapist who's real good and the therapist says, so, you want to end the tug of war. Yes. Let go of the rope. <laughs> but then they'll win. They'll win what? What will they win? And what does it hurt you? This is probably one of the more frequent kinds of calls. My mom, my dad is a pain in the tush. And I always say, if they're annoying or irritating, tolerate it with respect. They gave you life. They fed you. They clothed you. They taught you. They got you to this day so you could stand and turn around and go, what a pain in the neck. If they're evil, all bets are off. I think using a child for sexual pleasures tears up your parent card. But you have to remember that there's a triangle. And the triangle in your birth is God, the egg and the sperm. Remember the wheat and the bread? The egg and the sperm. You get together and make a baby, but that is in a triangle with God. And you are the conduit for the traditions of morality and decency between God and me, your child. I know I'm too old to be your kid, but you get the picture, all right? So God needs parental respect so that tradition of the commandments can go on. Without this, we lose an order. And you lose the ability to tolerate things that just don't go your way. Notice it doesn't say, love thy parent. You can't dictate emotions like that. But what you can say is in spite of your emotions, here's that word again, I'm ending. In spite of your emotions, you are obligated to be decent. Who said you should only deal with that which is comfortable 
or serves you. It doesn't say that in the commandments. If it's comfortable, and if it adds to your self-esteem, thou shalt. Otherwise, forget it. I am the Lord thy God. No, I didn't read that anywhere. The sixth commandment is most often read incorrectly as you shall not kill. It's not what it says. From the Hebrew, it says you shall not murder. And murder is the killing of an innocent. There was a movie called In the Nick of Time. You see that movie? This nice guy who's a single parent, of course, since Disney cartoons, there have never been two parents. Think about it, Thumper, everybody. The mother's always wiped out, right? Land before time, kill the mother off early, right? So <laughs> he's with his little girl, cute little bunchkin, and they're minding their own business, I think getting off a train. Suddenly, she snatched away from him. He's snatched off by some guys who are mean, who say, you have to assassinate this senator for us, because we don't want to wait for a recount. And uh, if you don't, we're going to kill your daughter. Where's the gun? I have to protect my daughter. My daughter comes first. Really? You shall love thy fellow as yourself. You're all created in God's image. Your blood is no redder than mine, and your daughter's is no redder than the senator's. Now this was, he was not presented as a religious person, but the way the movie went, this could have written, been written by an extremely religious individual, and it probably was. Because he had no justification to murder an innocent to protect his daughter's life. But he was justified in taking out the bad guy, which is ultimately what happened. But it was one of those movies where I got so many faxes from people saying they equivocated. But you see, if you accept through obligation and appreciation and love and awe and maybe even fear, the commandments, it gets simpler. And you know where you're focused. The seventh, adultery. How many of you think that one should be eliminated? Oh, you liars. <laughs> our passions and sexuality are so core to our being and so compelling that we sometimes abdicate our sense of obligation. It is through the recognition and the experience of your obligation to others that you really have a sense of well-being and happiness. Happiness does not make you laugh and go ding like winning the lottery might at some particular moment. Happiness, except for you guys, mostly makes us cry. When you are truly happy, you are so moved, <sighs> you lose your breath. And if you allow yourself, you probably cry. And it is through that intensity of investment and involvement with each other that brings that feeling. So, for idol worshiping, the moment of a thrill, we sacrifice satisfaction and true happiness that comes from the meaning and purpose we give our lives when we're valuable to somebody else. So far, we've talked about life and death, divine authority, sacred times, now suddenly we're going to things. God, we sounded so spiritual, sorry. And now we're going to things. You shall not steal. I thought God was very into all this spiritual stuff, you know? What's the big deal about me taking your things? If you're a spiritual person, you shouldn't care, right? So I'm gonna take your BMW. She smiled and said, okay. One of the most egregious, egregious situations I've seen that in some courts is almost justifiable stealing now is this bit because, you know, every divorce around the block is where the custodial parent takes the children and moves them away from the non-custodial parent who's not dangerous, who's not destructive, simply because they have a new honey, revenge, want to start a new life, revenge, 
have some other motivation. You notice I keep coming back to revenge because I think ultimately it's all rationalization for I'm going to hurt you. Now, I get in such terrible situations with people who say their partner has fooled around and gone off with a new honey, and they would like to move away because they don't want to deal with the pain, but that person, as terrible a thing that they've done, is invested in the children's lives. I mean, insult to injury. Not only did they do you wrong and do you bad, but you have to stay here and take it for the sake of the kids. Why? <laughs> Obligation to the children. Even if the other person is not decent enough to fulfill their obligation, you're obligated to fulfill yours. Because none of the commandments say, thou shalt do this, unless, of course, you've been screwed over. Then go for blood. Doesn't say that. The ninth commandment is about bearing false witness. Well, simplistically, it means, you know, when you go into a court of law, you don't tell an untruth. But there's nobody in this room who hasn't done bad things intentionally. I won't even ask for your hand to go up. There's nobody in this room who hasn't done a bad thing intentionally. And there's nobody in this room who just hasn't been stupid or wrong or, I don't know, impulsive or cowardly or this, that, or the other thing. There's no perfection here. We're struggling. Remember, we're potentially moral and we're constantly working for that ideal. So where you've been, if you take responsibility for where you've been, and you truly have remorse for where you've been, and you have worked to make sure you never repeat where you've been, you have a right to espouse where you are. That's what we call a teacher. So I have had too many calls from people who put themselves down that they don't have the right to make judgments and try to be helpful with people in certain areas because after all, they did bad things. Like, then who's left? So do as I say, not as I do, is a hypocrite. Do as I do, not as I did, is a teacher. And then my personal favorite, next to the Sabbath, is the Tenth Commandment, because this gets itchy. This gets itchy, itchy, itchy. Coveting. Nice earrings. <laughs> Been tremendous argument, is God? limiting, commanding thoughts and feelings? How do you do that? You can have them. You guys have had a million thoughts and a million feelings. Up, down, sideways, upset, happy, nervous, pensive, worried, guilty, enthralled, hopefully lots of enthralled, since you have gotten in here. You know, you can't even help some of them. They go in, they go out. But as somebody once said, a bird can land on your head. It's up to you whether you're going to let it nest there. When you get out of the thing and the do and the conquer attitude, those are not all bad things. I mean, without that, we never would have made penicillin. That sense of attack and accomplishment and straining and striving is also part of what God gave us. But to understand and really appreciate that ultimately we are responsible for creating meaning and purpose in our lives is what gives your life purpose and meaning. Not all the things and not all the accomplishments. You know how you live forever? Remember the movie Fame? Fame is how I will live forever? Well, there are two ways to live forever in everybody's memory. Be decisively evil. And be righteously decent. And your family and the tradition through the generations will have stories about you. And you will live forever. Right now is the time for all of us to act on our commitment to public television. 
Call the number on your screen and make a pledge of financial support to the best source of educational programming there is. And those wonderful people applauding right now are our terrific volunteers from Rockwell who are here helping us take your pledges. You know, Anne, I was thinking as we were watching Dr. Laura talk, where else but public television could you actually see Dr. Laura Schlesinger's Ten Commandments? I mean, it's rather daring programming because it really addresses very is. specific issues. Mm -hmm. And I don't think it's, some, I think it's something that you're going to see on commercial television. And that's why we're with you here tonight. That's right. If you enjoy programming like this, please call now, 1-800-278-5050. And Rockwell has issued a terrific challenge. That's right. It's the one-for-one one challenge for every dollar you pledge to KOCE for programs like Dr. Laura's that you've been watching this evening. Rockwell will donate $1 to each of your dollars. So a $20 pledge is going to turn out to be $40. $50 pledge is going to be $100. Be sure and call in with your pledge this evening because tonight is Rockwell's only night with us. So it's the only night that we're going to be doing the Rockwell Challenge. Before we go any further, though, we would like to thank for a generous pledge, Wesley Bellwood. He uh, called in earlier with a pledge uh, in memory of Carl Wynn from the Wynn Foundation. Thank you, Wesley. Mm -hmm. That's a magnificent thing that Wesley did, but we'd also like to ask you to join him in his sentiment by calling us tonight, because Dr. Laura Schlesinger's Ten Commandments is the kind of programming that we're proud of. You may not agree with her politics or her religious views, but you should agree with the fact that it's a wonderful program to be able to offer on television. And all you have to do is call 1-800-278-5050. And if you do, we have some terrific gifts for you. That's right. For a $60 pledge, you can have this audio cassette of Dr. Laura, The Ten Commandments. For a $75 pledge, you can have the book, Dr. Laura Schlesinger's The Ten Commandments, and she's on her book tour right now. That's right. If you'd like to have the VHS copy of this video in your home so that you can watch it and refer to it any old time you like, a $100 pledge will get you that gift. And of course, tonight's Rockwell Challenge Night, so if you call in tonight, your $100 pledge will not only get you the video, it will double your pledge. It'll be a $200 pledge. You uh, might want to use the installment plan for these pledges and for the thank you gifts. Consider spreading out your payments over a few months. We'll mail the gift to you after your final payment is made. Whatever you pledge, call us right now at 1-800-278-5050. We've made it very easy to join KOCE, and now it's up to you to make that call. Yes, and you'll feel great after you've made your pledge. I promise. <laughs> so please, do it right now. Count on KOCE to educate, to offer first-time discoveries, to teach our youth, to open our eyes and our minds, to stimulate our senses, to enrich our lives. The wonders of the world are at your fingertips with the lifelong learning available on KOCE. In everyday conversation, I find myself trying to pick apart what's everyday conversation and what becomes gossip, and it, it really drives me crazy. And is there, you know, a, a line there that I can kind of have an easier time picking it out? If you're going to talk about me, don't say anything about me that you would refrain from saying if I were sitting there with a cup of tea. All right, and have that for anybody. Imagine them there. Would there still be the necessity? Is it kind? And then you have to go back and think in yourself, what's going on with me? Here's the shrink hat going on. What is going on with me right now that I think is going to be repaired by being mean? Am I feeling, I don't know, left out of something? Am I feeling unimportant? Am I feeling stressed out? Am I feeling tired? Am I feeling unappreciated? I don't know what it is. But being mean is a moment of power. So it's usually based on us not feeling powerful in some way. And by you know, the brute strength of the ugly word. We have a moment of power, and we are aggrandizing ourselves because obviously that which we are saying about the other person is not us. We're better than that, or we'd be talking about ourselves. You know what stupid, bad, dumb thing I did yesterday? How about that kind of gossip? Anyway, it's one of the toughest things. I struggle with it, and I'm protesting about it all the time, and I struggle with it. And I go, oh, that's gossip. Can't say that. And I stop myself. And then I think, 
Do I have nothing else to talk about? You know, really? Do I have nothing else going on in my heart, my mind, my soul? Am I with people with whom I, I have nothing in common? In mind, heart, and soul? The only thing I have in common is playground politics? So, you start thinking who you really should be with and what are the things you could truly share and grow and accomplish, even if it's going to a movie together and then talking about the motivations and the reality and the morality and the ethics and getting into all of that and expanding yourself. There is nothing expansive, growth-promoting or decent that comes out of gossiping. It's just mean. But I think most of us may not see it as mean at the moment. It's entertainment. It's what you do when you get together. You talk about whoever isn't there. And wouldn't they be devastated? And something you've said about somebody to somebody else has now hurt that person's impression of them way out of proportion. Since they don't know that person a lot, that little thing that you said, which was only a small part of their personality or behavior, is the totality of what they know about that person. And see how much is lost? So I say out loud, whoops, I'm gossiping. And oh, do I want to. <laughs> oh, I want this moment. And I stop myself and be that honest about it. I want to hear this terrible thing you have to say about Marjorie, but it's wrong and I won't. <laughs> Hi, Dr. Laura. Hello. Dr. Laura, I have a problem with number 10, coveting. And I know you like to have really solid practical dilemmas, but since you're talking about the Ten Commandments, um, I want to ask you about this internal dilemma that sometimes doesn't manifest itself except in the things that I don't do. Um, I, I have a friend, I have a coworker, who I envy a lot. I, I look at her accomplishments and I see a, a certain job she got or a certain um, reward that she got, gets. And, and I get this overpowering anger that it's not me. And there's this sense that if she has it, then I can't have it. And I don't say anything so much, but it keeps me from having the best relationship I can with, with there her. Are and two things I hope will be helpful. The first is when you're feeling that way about somebody and there ain't nobody in this room who hasn't gone through this, okay? Including yours truly, right? Um, I remember in graduate school looking at one of the med school women and envying that and saying, at least she's homely. So, there's nothing abnormal about this. It's how persistent and how self-destructive we can get with it. Because the more self-destructive we are with it, the meaner we become. So, when you feel that feeling, go way out of your way to compliment her. Because it is amazing how your behavior changes your feelings. You know, we think, you know, I'm a licensed psychotherapist and I know this shtick. We think that if we sit and change our feelings, when that's all done somewhere in the next decade, then we will change our behaviors, when actually it is so effective the other way around. When you go up to her and give her a hug or a card or say, I'm going to take you out to lunch, that was terrific that you accomplished that, you cannot believe how good you start feeling and how maybe that good feeling then motivates you to do some of the things that you think you ought to do. But the reality is you are not this woman. She is here for one thing, you're here for something else. And it's not identical. You're different. In uh, Jewish tradition, during the Passover celebration, besides all this matzah you have to eat, there is this song we sing. And it's redundant in one sentence. And it's about the Exodus. You know, if you had just taken us out of Egypt, that would have been enough. 
if you had just taken us out for one day getting mana from heaven, that would have been enough. And it goes through the entire thing with each step, it would have been enough. What is that meaning? We have gotten to the point where we have to have it all before we feel grateful and have some sense of peace. And there was a woman at her husband's funeral who said, if I had only known him 10 minutes, it would have been enough. If I had only had one child with him, it would have been enough. And she went on like that. It is a spiritual, philosophical way of looking at things that you have to train yourself into. And that is, as you stand here, do you realize you're able to stand here? Maybe that's enough. Do you realize you're able to discuss things with me and you have an intellect that, and, and a courage that led you to say this out loud in front of all people? Maybe that's enough. So you have so many qualities that aren't enough for you to be happy because it's not everything you cumulatively see that everybody else has. But you know, there probably aren't 10 other people in this room who would have had the guts to stand up and talk about a weakness out loud to get some help with it. Do you realize how extraordinary that is? If that would be enough. Thank you. Hi, Dr. Laura. Hi. I suffer from genetic overspending. My mother did it. I do it, and my two daughters are doing it. Mm. And I want to know which commandment I should pay attention to and what suggestions you can give me. Let's see. One, you assume no authority over your desires. Two, acquisition of things is idol worship. I don't know if you go thank God when you fit it all in the car, so. I don't know about three. Uh, let's see, four, you probably shop on the Sabbath. That's blown. Uh, you have to go cold turkey to know what the pain is. If you have a pain, and I'm constantly giving you Demerol, I'll never, it takes away the pain. So I can't diagnose and I don't know where anything is. There's a pain and shopping is Demerol. And until you stop the Demerol, we won't know what's hurting. And until you know that, you can't approach it and do it in a way that brings you self-respect. The Ten Commandments are like an A, B, C. They're letters, you put the letters together into words and the words can create great beauty. You take the Ten Commandments, you apply them to the situations in your life, and you can create Great beauty. Bless you. Good night. Shalom. This is PB. Well, we hope you've enjoyed Dr. Laura's session of the Ten Commandments. I know I did. As a matter